from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm David Levithan. Hi. I, I've been informed, and you can check because maybe that's wrong, um, but I'm about to talk a lot about my new book, Every Day, which is actually sold out um, in the bookstore, if you haven't already gotten your copy. I'm told there was something called a deluge of nerd fighters this morning. Um, yes. But, oh, you are so in luck. Um, I and the amazing, incredible, wonderful Jackie Woodson, Jacqueline Woodson, are reading tonight at 6.30 at Politics and Prose, where they will have limitless copies of my book and as well as Jackie's book. So please, whether you have a copy to be signed or not, please come tonight. But if you don't and don't have the opportunity to get it here, please come tonight and you'll have an opportunity there. All right, the other thing, which I can't do while holding a microphone, um, this is Ninja. Ninja is touring with me. Um, Ninja's brother, Ninja Bro, lives in Iowa, and we, um, Ninja Bro's guardian and I exchange photos. So I'm gonna have to take a picture of you guys now with Ninja, so please, please just smile when I'm taking the picture. All right, now to business. I will now read from behind the podium because I'm clearly very shy. <laughs> All right, I also, also have to say my family is here, which is really cool. Um, one person who is here, yes, there, there is Matthew, there is Paige to whom my new book is dedicated, and then who, the woman who has never been, well, I think I can say girl, who's never um, been to one of my readings before is Haley. Now, Haley, Haley, over here. Would you mind waving to these people? All right. Now, if everybody could please now wave back to Haley. All right. Thank you. This happens at every reading I do, Haley. Just want you to know. All right. So I am here. Well, I guess I'm here um, because I have a new book out called Every Day. Um, Probably all you know about it at this point is that John Green likes it, which is, this is a good thing to know. How many of you were here this morning for the first, yeah, 10 a.m.? Wow, you guys are like hardcore National Book Festival people. I appreciate that. Um, so Every Day is the story of a person who, since birth, has woken up every morning in the life and the body of a different person, um, ha has never known any other life, and really has gone through life like this, not, of course, any knowing any differently. Um, I am going to read. I know it's sort of verboten at this festival, but I feel it's best for you to sample it by hearing it rather than me talking about it. Um, but then I'll talk about it a little more, and then we'll talk about other things. It's going to be fabulous. So I am going to start at the beginning, which is a wonderful place to start. Um, who got the reference? Okay, yeah, okay, good, good. All right, I like it when there are theater geeks in the audience. Um, so again, this is... In A's body, it starts like this. I wake up. Immediately, I have to figure out who I am. It's not just the body, opening my eyes and discovering whether the skin on my arm is light or dark, whether my hair is long or short, whether I'm fat or thin, boy or girl, scarred or smooth. The body is the easiest thing to adjust to if you're used to waking up in a new one each morning. It's the life the context of the body that can be hard to grasp. Every day I am someone else. I am myself, I know I am myself, but I am also someone else. It has always been like this. The information is there. I wake up, open my eyes, understand that it is a new morning, a new place. The biography kicks in, a welcome gift from the mind. Today I am Justin. Somehow I know this, my name is Justin. And at the same time, I know that I'm not really Justin. I'm only borrowing his life for a day. I look around and know that this is his room. This is his home. The alarm will go off in seven minutes. I'm never the same person twice, but I've certainly been this type before. Clothes everywhere, far more video games than books. Sleeps in his boxers. From the taste of his mouth, a smoker. But not so addicted that he needs one as soon as he wakes up. Good morning, Justin, I say, checking out his voice, low. The voice in my head is always different. 
Justin doesn't take care of himself. His scalp itches, his eyes don't want to open. He hasn't gotten much sleep. Already, I know I'm not going to like today. It's hard being in the body of someone you don't like because you still have to respect it. I've harmed people's lives in the past and I've found that every time I slip up, it haunts me. So I try to be careful. From what I can tell, every body I inhabit is the same age as me. I don't hop from being 16 to being 60. Right now, it's only 16. I don't know how this works or why. I stopped trying to figure it out a long time ago. I'm never going to figure it out any more than a normal person will figure out his or her own existence. After a while, you have to be at peace with the fact that you simply are. There's no way to know why. You can have theories, but there will never be proof. Now, Justin goes to school, or Justin goes to school, A goes to school in Justin's body, um, and really is planning, as usual, to just go through the day without making any connections whatsoever. Um, but very quickly, sort of the course of his day, his her day, and the course of his her life changes. As I take Justin's books out of his locker, I can feel someone hovering on the periphery. I turn and the girl standing there is as transparent or is transparent in her emotions, tentative and expectant, nervous and adoring. I don't have to access Justin to know that this is his girlfriend. No one else would have this reaction to him, so unsteady in his presence. She's pretty, but she doesn't see it. She's hiding behind her hair, happy to see me and unhappy to see me at the same time. Rhiannon, her, her name is Rhiannon. And for a moment, just the slightest beat, I think, yes, this is the right name for her. I don't know why, I, I don't know her, but it feels right. This is not Justin's thought, it's mine. I try to ignore it. I'm not the person she wants to talk to. Hey, I say, casual to a fault. Hey, she murmurs back. She's looking at the floor, at her inked in converse. There's, she's drawn cities there, skylines around the souls. Something's happened between her and Justin, and I don't know what it is. It's probably not something that Justin even recognized at the time. Are, are you okay? I ask. I see the surprise on her face, even as she tries to cover it. This is not something that Justin normally asks. And the strange thing is, I want to know the answer. The fact that he wouldn't care makes me want to know it more. Sure, she says, not sounding sure at all. I find it hard to look at her. I know from experience that beneath every peripheral girl is a central truth. She's hiding hers away, but at the same time, she wants me to see it. That is, she wants Justin to see it. And it's there, just out of my reach. A sound waiting to be a word. She is so lost in her sadness that she has no idea how visible it is. I think I understand her. For a moment, I presume to understand her. But then, within this sadness, she surprises me with a brief flash of determination, bravery even. Shifting her gaze away from the floor, her eyes matching mine, she asks, are you mad at me? I can't think of a single reason to be mad at her. If anything, I am mad at Justin for making her feel so diminished. It's there in her body language. When she is around him, she makes herself small. No, I say, I'm not mad at you at all. I tell her what she wants to hear, but she doesn't trust it. I feed her the right words, but she suspects they're threaded with hooks. This is not my problem. I know that. I am here for one day. I cannot solve anyone's relationship. I should not change anyone's life. I turn away from her, get my books out, close the locker. She stays in the same spot, anchored by the profound, desperate loneliness of a bad relationship. Do you still want to get lunch today? She asks. The easy thing would be to say no. I often do this, sense the other person's life drawing me in and run in the other direction. But there's something about her, 
the cities on her shoes, the flash of bravery, the unnecessary sadness that she's carrying, that makes me want to know what the word will be when it stops being a sound. I have spent years meeting people without ever knowing them. And on this morning, in this place, with this girl, I feel the faintest pull of wanting to know. And in a moment of either weakness or bravery on my part, I decide to follow it. I decide to find out more. Absolutely, I say. Lunch would be great. Again, I read her. What I've said is too enthusiastic. Justin is never enthusiastic. Uh, it'll be cool, I add. She's relieved, or at least as relieved as she'll allow herself to be, which is a very guarded form of relief. By accessing, I know she and Justin have been together for over a year, but that's as specific as it gets. Justin doesn't remember the exact date. She reaches out and takes my hand. I'm surprised by how good this feels. I'm glad you're not mad at me, she says. I just want everything to be OK. I nod. If there's anything I've learned, it's this. We all want everything to be OK. We don't even wish so much for fantastic or marvelous or outstanding. We will happily, happily settle for OK, because most of the time, OK is enough. The first bell rings. I'll see you later, I say. It's such a basic promise, but to Rhiannon, it means the world. So yes, one moment. So sorry, I, I read the passages, not assuming that you've all read it, um, because I want to sort of explain how I got here. Now, I will say this is a hard, hard thing, and I'm going to just cut off the question that would no doubt come from the audience of, oh, where did this idea come from? Because unlike every single other book I've written, I have no idea or no memory of how this idea came to me. I'm sure I was just walking to work one day, and I thought, oh, waking up every morning in a different body, huh, and just sort of filed it away in the, in the waiting room. Is that phone call for me? Um, in the waiting room of ideas. Um, and then sort of after I had written the book before and was sort of deciding what to write next, that idea sort of stood up in the waiting room and said, me, please, me. Um, and I thought, OK, this is interesting. And I, I started the book. I don't, I don't outline. I just write. Um, I keep saying that I'm going to outline, and I never get around to it. Um, but this was the first book that I set two questions for myself. The first question is, is the question about A. So what would your life be like if you did change bodies every day? Which is to say that what would your body be like if you had no set gender, you had no set race, you had no set religion, sexual orientation would really be an, it, it's not an issue because gender isn't an issue. Um, you had no parents, you had no friends, you weren't from one house. Ultimately, you, you would just be a self. You'd be that, that core thing about you that is just you. And that was a really interesting way to approach a character and certainly raised a lot of issues for myself as I was reading it as far as sort of what, who am I if I'm not all of these things that define me? And then from Rhiannon's point of view, the question is, could you actually love somebody who changed every day? And, and anybody who's been in a relationship knows that even slight changes, wait, you're growing a mustache, huh? Can, can cause sort of reverberations and you have to adjust to it. But what if there was such a massive adjustment every day? Could, could love conquer that? Could, could you actually love somebody who did that? And I, I will freely admit, I did not know the answer to either of these questions when I started writing the book. I very much wrote the book to figure out what the answers were. And, and found myself going down some very strange roads that I did not expect to go down. So again, it, it's interesting. I like to sort of vary up my books. Um, I try to not write the same book twice, um, which leads to a very spotty or, or all over the place um, list of books that I've written. Um, I also, as many of you are aware, like to shake it up also by writing with other people. I've written, obviously, Will Grayson, Will Grayson with John. I've written um, three books with Rachel Cohn. Um, I've written a book with a photographer named Jonathan Farmer. Um, I have a book coming out in May with Andrea Kramer, who wrote Nightshade. So that also, to me, is, is sort of a form of being inventive. Because when you write with another person, you certainly never write a book that you would have written alone. They bring out something different in you, 
and that energy is what drives you to do it. Um, I'm often asked, um, do I prefer one or the other? And the answer is no, I actually love both of them. And one of the amazing things about writing is you can do whatever the heck you want. Um, and you can collaborate and you can write solo and you can write science fiction and you can write love story, whatever you want to do, you can just do it. And I love doing that and I love that I'm in a space where I can do that. Um, and I'm always pushing people to do that. Among the people I push are my editors, which are my editors, my authors. Um, because I'm also an editor. I'm a publisher and editorial director at Scholastic. Those of you who saw Maggie Stiefvater will have to tell me if she said nasty things about me after I had to leave. Um, but she is one of my authors who I'm very proud of. Um, I also worked on The Hunger Games, which is a book you might be familiar with. So it's really interesting because even though I, I have purely have an editorial mind when working on those books, it exposes me to the crazy, crazy, wonderful imaginations of so many other authors. And it makes me realize sort of how we each bring such weirdly individual things to all of our books and then bring them out accordingly, which is pretty awesome. So I think I, I once made the mistake, which I'll now make again, that, that I'm always much better in Q&A than I am just talking. I really enjoy Q&A more. Um, and I say this is a mistake because I was at a library convention and I said this, and during the signing, um, one of the librarians came up and she was like, oh yeah, you are much better in Q&A. And I was like, wait, wait, oh, that's not what I meant, okay. Um, so yeah, we have plenty of time. So um, they've set up, for those of you who don't know the drill, two microphones here. Um, it'll be like watching the US Open. I will go back and forth. So if you have a question, please come up to the microphone and we will start that portion of our program. If nobody has questions, this will be really awkward. Oh, good, good, they're coming, they're coming. We will start with the tourists. <laughs> Somehow I knew your sign. I don't know how, but <laughs> I'm that good. Um, you talked about being an editor. I, most writers are incredibly um, critiquing of their own work and they're very picky and it never feels right. Is it even harder for you as an editor or are you able to pass your work on to somebody else for, and accept the, the input that they give you? That's a great question. I mean, I, I would never, ever, ever presume to be able to edit my own work. It, it, when I get to a point that there's a first draft, I have to immediately bring it to my editor um, and let her read it and, and give feedback because I'm, I'm blind to it at that point. I certainly think that the fact that I spend my day editing does make me write cleaner because I am, and certainly not cleaner as in I don't use curse words, I certainly use plenty of those, <laughs> but, um, but cleaner in, insofar as I think there's a lot of editing that goes on in my head before I actually write, and that's just something that's the way that I'm wired, mm -hmm. but absolutely, I, I barely read over my own work before I give it to my editor. I usually read it over once or twice and then hand it to her because I just think, okay, I need that objective opinion now. Hey, okay, thanks. All right, Captain America. I was wondering, since you write a lot of queer books, I was wondering like, why you like to write those so much? Um, besides being a big old gay boy? Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I think I wrote Boy Meets Boy for many reasons. Um, Boy Meets Boy, my first book, started out as a Valentine story for my friends. Um, I've had this tradition since high school of writing a Valentine story for my friends. It was supposed to be a short story, um, and then got longer and longer. I was like, oh, wow, I'm writing my first teen novel without intending it. Um, but I found as I was writing it, it was informed by a conversation I'd had with um, my best friend's best friend who grew up in a very conservative house in Idaho. And it was an interesting contrast that our experiences had been completely different. That, that, that his family would have disowned him, he pretended to be straight, he actually got married as a way of sort of faking them out. Um, and so when I got home, I thought, you know what, I, I kind of want to write a story for him when he was a teenager. Um, there's also this amazing, amazing Patty Griffin song called Tony, which is about a gay kid who kills himself. And every time I listened to the song, I wanted to rewrite the ending. And so, strangely, I wrote a novel in order to change the ending of a song. But then as I was writing it, I realized that the, sort of the history of YA literature for, for queer kids was sort of first death, then death of your dog. This is true. Dogs would die when you were making out with somebody um, in the 70s. Um, that does not happen anymore. Um, <laughs> And then it was misery, and then like we had gotten to the point with a few notable exceptions, like Annie on my mind or Weetsy Bat, but most of the queer characters, like 
the only status they were given were like, okay, you can be an outsider and maybe you can find another outsider and you guys can just hold hands and that's the end of the book. And I just wanted to write a romantic comedy. I wanted to write a dippy happy love story with two gay boys um, and this wonderful town that they live in and that's, that's what fueled that. And obviously because I'm gay and because I interact with queer kids all the time, I'm constantly trying to find different angles to tell their stories because there aren't enough of us telling those stories. And it just, it's really, really interesting. And I think the more of us that are telling the stories, the more vibrant the literature is. And again, the effect that it has in the world is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So that's why. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Hogwarts. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you mentioned uh, how you like to write with other authors, like uh, Will Grayson. Will Grayson was one of them. Um, how, what, what is the hardest part of writing with another author, like collaborating on a book? Uh, what sort of hurdles have you come across and how do you sort of fix those issues or work through them? I mean, I've been really, really lucky because every time I've written with someone, it's worked really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if I were a control freak, it would be hell because you have to, going into it, realize that the book is only half yours and because most of the time I alternate chapters with the other author, so, so the book will just get hijacked in different ways. And so you just have to be okay with that and just enjoy it. And that's, that's for me what happens is that I just enjoy seeing where the other author takes it. There are certainly times different authors have different quirks that, and I certainly have quirks too, that you have to, you have to get used to. Um, John is an amazing, amazing reviser and I was worried that he would actually revise away some of my favorite parts of the first draft. So I'd be like, I am standing in front of the tank on this one. You are not changing this paragraph. Um, Rachel and I have a great relationship and we also sort of, if something isn't working, we will call each other on it. Um, famously in Naomi and Eli's um, No Kiss List, our second book together, we alternated perspectives as to who was telling the story and we could choose whoever we wanted. So I, I sent her, I guess, chapter six and I got a one-line email from her in return saying, we are not going to be the authors who tell the story from the point of view of the dog. <laughs> so if you read chapter six, you will see the dog is strangely active in that scene, but he is not in fact telling the scene. So you have to have that kind of relationship. With Andrea, with Invisibility, the Invisibility, the book coming out in May, is about a boy born invisible um, who's living in New York um, alone and a girl moves into his building who can see him. And it's about sort of their love story, but also about why, what is it about her that can see him and what is it about him that is making him invisible. And because of that, and because it was speculative fiction, we couldn't, usually I write with other people without an outline, we just sort of go for it. But after a f about eight chapters, we, s we sat down and we were like, okay, we, we have to figure out sort of the magic system here because if we're making that up as we go along, it's gonna be a very ugly book. So, so that was the first time I ever actually plotted a little bit out with another author, but it worked well. Mm, Thanks thank for the question. Mm -hmm. All right, game over, that's, that's dire. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the end is near, game over, Levithan. Okay. It, I, I must say, that just for the people in the back, that I'm actually reading out what's on their t-shirts, so if you're like, <laughs> why did he look at that poor, wonderful woman and say, game over, th th that is why, that is why. I did read one of those books that came out in the 70s that was like one of the ones where the dog gets killed after yeah. the two boys make out. Yeah. Um, but Has that ever happened to you, David? No. <laughs> Sorry. That, that <laughs> no, no. Uh, my favorite book is Will Grayson, Will Grayson. And my favorite character is Tiny, mm -hmm. who's like the most lovable and hateable character in the book simultaneously. How did you get inspired to write a character like him, who's like anything but tiny and larger than life and everything. I mean, tiny was John's invention. It's in his first chapter. Um, and w the way John and I did it, and if I'm repeating anything that John said earlier, just tell me and I'll stop. But um, we actually, instead of sending chapters back and forth to each other, because our first few chapters were happening at the same time, we wrote our first chapters at the same time. And then I went over to his place um, with his wife there. and we read them aloud to each other. And the minute he started reading Tiny's character, I was like, I can use this, this is awesome. He's, he's totally coming into my half of the story too. So it was kind of wonderful to, to share a character so closely and to have somebody be so bombastic. I mean, the great, the great wonderful revelation of it was, for me, for perhaps demographic reasons, but also anyone who's ever read my books will know that me being into writing fake musicals is not a surprise to anybody. 
But man, John got so into it too. I was like, man, you're a musical fan. No, no, no. Yes, you are. Um, so we just had a ball with it. Um, I will say, and this is, I'm going to keep plugging things, but um, one of the most amusing things that I found is, is um, I was lucky enough to totally take my entire group. Um, we, we cut work. My boss is here. Sorry. Um, on Friday to go see Perks of Being a Wallflower, um, which every single one of you must see at least five times. It is, it is extraordinary. But it's really funny because Ezra Miller in that movie playing Patrick, like if you had him gain 500 pounds, he would be Tiny Cooper. So it was really nice to see there are Tiny Coopers everywhere, even if they're thin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I don't get a nickname. OK. <laughs> yeah. so Pattern. Like, I, if you don't have something written on your shirt, I can't comment oh, on friends. it. Um, so one of the reasons I keep coming back to your books just over the years is because they are so, like, as you say, kind of like hip, like dippily happy and whimsical and kind of optimistic in this way. And I find myself thinking about, like, this idea that kind of exists that something, unless it, like, exposes the dark nature of humanity, isn't somehow true. So I, I was wondering kind of if you could speak a little bit about that and if you ever encounter that kind of tension when you're writing. No, ab absolutely. I mean, I think it is one of the, the great biases of literature to think that darkness equals truth, which, again, you can absolutely find d truth in darkness and pain, but you also find truth in happiness mm -hmm. and joy in the good things that happen. And I, I like to balance that out. Partially, and I'm not just saying that because my parents are in the audience, I've, I had like no adolescent angst that like there's no big will of, or well of, of awfulness that I can dredge up, so I have to make it up. Um, so, but I like to disprove that. Also, not just in the content of the books, but there is this wonderful idea that you have to be dark and depressed in order to write great literature. And I, I do want to disprove that because most of the authors that I know are pretty happy people and they write amazing books. So I think if you want to go towards darkness or you are sort of dealing with your own inner darkness, I think that is absolutely valid and a lot can be learned and a lot of literature can come from that. But I think also describing happiness in those causes is just as illuminating. So I certainly didn't set out, I set out to do that with Boy Meets Boy, but it's sort of set the pace for the rest of my books since then. Um, the, the YA squad jokingly calls me the least likely author to write a serial killer book. Um, <laughs> so. So I, I think I'm just going to keep doing that because I think that is as interesting to me as pain. Thanks. That's a great question. Thanks. Hello there. Hello. All right. So nobody's mentioned my favorite book of yours yet, which is uh, How They Met, which is oh. all short stories, and everybody should buy it because it's awesome. Um, but this is not really a serious question. I was just wondering if you had a favorite story out of all of those because I bought it to get it signed today, and I was back in my dorm room rereading it, and I was like, these are all so good. <laughs> I was like, this is my favorite. No, this one it. No, no. I mean, that's work. my favorite question to ask people when they say they like the book is, which is your favorite? Um, but then, of course, it does always boomerang towards nice. me. And I'm like, uh, yeah. um, I have I have a soft spot for Starbucks Boy, the first I story in there. Um, you made me disappointed it, every time I go to Starbucks now. There, exactly. Well, not there a always guy. is a Starbucks Boy there. No, there's not, it's though. Not where really? I'm from. Really? Yeah, I come from Ooh, Tennessee. You have to call corporate Th headquarters. I know. <laughs> that's, that's like, why pay $6 for I your coffee know. if there's not going to be a cute boy behind the counter? I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. So that's just, uh, it's, you, like, it's, it's a shame. You should take that to the world court. I mean, I will. So, so I will say that. But also, there, there's a story in there that is about how my grandparents met. And I, I love that story, too, because it's all true. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably the, the only all true story that I've, I've written and published. Um, so that has a sweet spot for that, too. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you love the book. Hello. Aren't you warm in that hat? His name is Asa, and he's my best friend. Okay, well, I, I don't, okay. do you often wear best friends on your head? Should I try that? I might go home and try that. We'll see how he reacts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so some authors are, like, all, all authors are in some way, shape, or form connected, like, slightly connected to, like, uh, the online portion of their books, but you and like the other authors who are also nerdfighters more than like anyone. How like does nerdfighteria and other online communities influence your writing? Do you think about it while you're writing your books or like? Yeah, I mean, it was it was astonishing to me when I was touring with John for Will Grace and Will Grayson, sort of the the extraordinary things that he and the nerdfighters have done. Like I I I, was I married into the nerdfighter family. I mean, I was certainly there and supporting John from the beginning, but but. I didn't quite see it until I was out there with him and seeing it. And it's, it's extraordinary. There is nothing else like it. But as for does it affect what I write, or does any interaction at a signing or on Facebook affect, it doesn't really, honestly. I mean, the stories 
come from such a story place for me. It really is, it's gonna sound really selfish, but it really is all about what question I wanna answer for myself or what is interesting me at the time. And certainly, I'm aware of how it will go out into the world and certainly feeling the support for it makes me take mu many more risks than I would have. The book that I have coming out next, probably next September, right now is called Two Boys Kissing. And it is, it is a crazy, crazy um, patchwork of five different stories intersecting and, and it's not narrated by a Greek chorus of dead gay men. And it's, it's really something that like, if I was starting out and I didn't feel the support, it would have been put in my drawer. Like, it would have been like, yeah, that, that's nice. But because I know that readers like you and probably everybody here are so adventurous, it allows me to be adventurous in my writing. And I'm not writing what I think you want to read, but I am writing what I want to write because I know odds are you'll be willing to read it. Thank you. Hello there. Hi. Um, my favorite thing that you've written is a lover's dictionary. Uh, and uh, my former girlfriend and I would, we, it went back and forth between the both of us, and we'd both make margin, like notes in the margins and stuff. Um, and so I've always wondered what your favorite word was from it. If oh my goodness! Um, so for those of you who are not <laughs> aware, too much gay talk. The police are coming. Um, <laughs> so I, for those of you who are not familiar with Lovers Dictionary, is the only book that I've written about grown-ups. I do not say for grown-ups because I think plenty of grown-ups read my YA books and plenty of teens read Lover's Dictionary. Um, but it is the story of a relationship told entirely in dictionary form. Um, and I do have, much to everybody's chagrin and madness, I don't actually have a David Levithan Twitter, but I do have a Lover's Diction Twitter, which is an ongoing Twitter of this. But So as far as what my favorite entry is, it would be between Elegy and Contiguous, because um, Contiguous has my favorite image in the book, but Elegy is, I think, the thing that I wrote that actually gets the emotion of the relationship the most. So, and if you come to the signing later, I will ask you what your favorite is, but I will not put you on the spot now. All right. Hello. My question is also about a lover's dictionary since I finished reading it on the bus ride here. And I was trying to figure out how you managed to write a book um, that's not exactly chronological in time. And so I was wondering how you wrote a book like that if that makes any sense. I mean, the, the, the crazy thing about Lover's Dictionary, again, it started as a Valentine's story for my friends, much more recently. Um, it was February 1st, and I had not started writing yet. Those of you familiar with the calendar will know that this, I had left myself 13 days to write a story. Um, and I happened to have on my desk a book, a New York Times book of words you need to know that I had picked up from my parents' basement. It was a bar mitzvah present or a graduation present. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, and what I did is I literally went through and on each spread, I chose one word and decided to write the story of a relationship using one word from each spread of pages. And I wrote it non-chronologically. It, like, it was almost like a word association. Um, this word, what does it spark? And so I don't know how I did it. Um, I think it was just not thinking about it. I, again, obviously if I wrote it that quickly, I wasn't thinking very much about it. But it was just seeing what came out. And the, the, the lovers in the book really I felt like I knew them as I was going through and just sort of pieced together their relationship. There are many additional things after the Valentine story and there was, it was revised, but that's sort of where it came from, just somewhere inside. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's felt inspired to write by people like you. Um, so my question is, how do you make the transition from the reader to the writer? I mean, I think you just write and write and write and write. I mean, I know that's almost cliche advice, but I think I think I was a reader first, then I was an editor, then I was a writer. I mean, I was always writing, but I wasn't putting myself out as a writer. Um, and I think that's really, you just, you have to just keep at it and not worry. One of my biggest fears about where we are right now in far, is insofar as writing is that everybody thinks that publication is the goal, and that is absolutely not true. Writing the best possible thing is the goal. And a lot of people rush things out and they put them on Figment and they, they do whatever they want to do and they, they think, oh, I'll send it to agents. I'm 16 years old, I should have an agent. And that's not, that I would be a, a really crappy writer if I had done that. Instead, what I did is I just wrote for myself and I s sometimes gave it to friends who put smiley faces in the margins and I revised. And that's how you make the transition. And I also allowed myself to fail a lot because I think part of writing is failing and not getting frustrated by failing and just learning from why you're failing and then come back to it. So I think that's really how to make the transition is to just keep doing it. And then 
when after your friends have read it and when you feel this is the best it can be, then take it out into the world a little bit more. Thanks. All right, thanks. Okay. Hi. Hello, A. <laughs> it's um, Al if you know Alex J's m music video for Forever Yours. You know, you totally, totally could have kissed my ass and said it was from every day. Like, oh, the character <laughs> A, this is from I that. Could have said that. But no, from Sorry. some YouTube person. So sick of YouTube people. <laughs> um, uh, my question is sort of bouncing off what you were just saying. Um, and um, I know in How They Met, um, a lot of the stories are ones that you wrote when, like, you were younger, um, or, like, at least, like, started when you were younger. And I was wondering how much, like, have like the things that you wrote when you were younger like ended up in your writing today and like have you like built on things that like you have you like changed things and published I don't know if that Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, certainly every now and then I go back and read old things or things that failed that I think, "Oh, maybe it's time now." Um, Gail Foreman, if you're familiar, great author, has a great metaphor that I love that there are some books or some things you've written that are starter logs, which is that that they're basically just mulch. They 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 fail, they but other trees grow from them. And certainly I've had novels or I've had ideas that weren't right for when I was writing it at the time, but then became books. Like the best example is Are We There Yet? My, my third book started as a Valentine's story 10 years before it was a novel. And I would just keep going back to it and keep making it a little bit longer and revising and, oh, maybe it should be from this character's point of view. So I think never, the, the worst thing I can ever hear is when writers are like, oh, I deleted that. I'm like, no, don't ever delete anything. Like, just keep it there in the graveyard, and there could be a resurrection someday. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Hi, David. Uh, I'm reading every day, and my question It's good to read every day. It's Sorry, I just, yeah. the, the puns are. <laughs> um, my question is, did you ever consider making the first character with A in a female body instead of a male body? and why or why not you chose to have it in the male body? And then also, were you at all influenced by Jeanette Winterson's Written on the Body, which is another sort of gender ambiguous protagonist narrated love right. story? Yeah. Um, so the first question, that the answer is no. I j honestly, A woke up in the body of Justin before I knew that there would be Rhiannon. So it was just, that was where the story started. I, again, I never really think too much about things before I start writing. So it's not, it's not that I sat down and chose like, oh, who will this be? It was just sort of that's who it was. But I very much, I mean, it's been very interesting in all the reviews and people, pe and even myself, get thrown because they assume A is male because A happens to be in a male body at first. But that's just not true. Um, and I want that to be a source of tension within the book. Um, and then, oh God, there was a second part of your question and I've already... Written on the body. Oh, oh, written on the body. No, um, but I would suspect, um, although I would never in a million years presume to speak for Jeanette Winterson, whose yeah. memoir, if you have not read it, is amazing. Um, I was, once I had the idea and I started working on it, definitely I was thinking a lot about Orlando by Virginia Woolf, who I would imagine may have been on Jeanette Winterson's mind as well. Um, so that was sort of the template. And there's a YA book um, by Lauren McLaughlin um, that also called Cycler about, um, I think it's, it's a girl who w once a month, instead of getting a period, becomes a boy. Um, so definitely, again, I wasn't consciously thinking of that, but I always thought that's, that's awesome. Um, so I think, not, not in real life awesome, but for a book it's awesome. Um, so definitely those were, if, when I, was asked, oh, what are you working on? What is it like? Those were sort of the two reference points. All right. Okay, I'm going to be somewhat blasphemous. Um, <laughs> I hate your books. Uh, okay. No, but as an angsty teenager, mid-high school, the first time I read Boy Meets Boy, I hated it. Mm -hmm. um, it was a feel-good love story, and I was kind of like not in the mood for those, I guess. <laughs> anyway, I went back later and ended up rereading it because I bought it to give to... Uh, friend's younger sibling, but, um, and liked it much better. Oh, sure. And, you know, gifted it to the friend's younger sibling as a way of being like, so you're queer here. Um, anyway, one of the things that I liked about it upon rereading it was that it was a love story. It wasn't just like, oh, it's queer people. It's a queer story. Uh, it was a love story. And I like that you've done that in your books. Um, and I guess if I wondered if you had any thoughts on the sort of the queer fiction um, for young adults, how sometimes it's hard to avoid a book getting pinned as 
queer fiction as opposed to it's fiction and it happens to have queer people doing cool things. Right. I mean, I think, I mean, I think that it's important to have sort of the roundedness to any character you draw. And the minute you have a one-note character that they're defined by any characteristic, it's it's pretty that that's not successful writing. I think most of my queer YA friends. I mean, we we are of two minds of this. That on the one hand. It being labeled as queer is good because then the right people get to it and the people who wouldn't, I mean, boy meets boy, you'd pretty much have to be an imbecile not to know that it's a gay book because of the title, but other books, Will Grayson, Will Grayson, you don't know. Um, so that helps knowing that it's being put out there as that just because it will get into the right hands, but you don't want to be defined by that. The, the, the angriest I've ever been in at a review um, the good thing is I don't actually remember which, which journal it was in, but it was in one of the library journals. And they were reviewing Boy Meets Boy, and they basically said, they said, oh, well, yes, buy this instead of Alex Sanchez's Rainbow High. If you buy one queer book this year, it should be this book. And I thought, you asshole. Like, what you would never say, oh, if you buy one book by a Jew, buy this book. Oh, if you buy one black book, buy this one. It was just such a bizarre thing, and it showed me that we, we weren't there yet as far as representation, even within our own literature and our own literary world. Again, this is almost 10 years ago. I don't think that would ever be said now because there is such vibrant writers and such vibrant writing. So again, I think, I think we're good. Um, but that, that, again, I embrace it. Um, because I do think it's valuable, and I don't mind at all that people know that I'm a queer writer. I think there's power in that, but I certainly would never want to be pigeonholed by that, and luckily, I don't seem to be. All right, so I think, yes, I think we have to wrap up, but if you have more questions, I will be signing. Now, I will say, I've been trying on this tour, and God knows John did me a big favor by telling y'all who are here this morning that he liked my book. So I'm, I'm doing book recommendations, are you ready? Get, get, get out your, your phones, get out your piece of paper, because you have to read these three books, if you read any three books this year. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hi highlighting ones that I feel might not be on your radar, because like Maggie's book is awesome, but you know that Libba's book is awesome. All right, so a book that came out this spring is called The Disenchantments by Nina LaCour. It is awesome. It is like one of the best like music books I've ever written, uh, or written, read. Sorry, Nina. Um, it's just, it's pretty amazing. It, it is about... Um, a boy who's about to go on tour with his, basically the girl he loves band um, for just like right before they're going off to college. And he thinks that this girl is, is taking a year off with him and going through Europe. And literally like the night before they're about to leave, she says, actually, I got into college and I'm not going with you. And then he has to go on the tour with her anyway. It's, uh, it's amazing. Um, and then two books that are not out yet that you must read. Um, there's a book that's coming out October 1st, so almost there called Endangered. It's by Elliot Schrafer. Um, it is a book that I edited, but that's not why I'm saying it. It is about um, a girl who is half American, half Congolese, and her mother runs a bonobo refuge in the Congo. And she doesn't want to be there. She goes there for the summer, makes a big mistake in sort of bonding with one of the bonobos. And then militants attack the sanctuary, and she has to go into the wild with a few bonobos and survive. And it's really, right now, in sort of our era of like, vampires and dystopias and everything, it's really amazing to see somebody writing something that's so real and talking about things that are not really talked about. So I highly recommend that. And finally, um, October, I believe, 23rd, so two or three weeks later, um, A.S. King, who's an amazing writer, has a new book called Ask the Passengers. Somebody's cheering every choice I do, which is great. So it's not just me. She agrees. Um, and it is one of the best YA love stories and identity stories, queer or otherwise, that I have read in many, many years. So please embrace that one as well. Obviously, I don't mind if you buy my books as well and support my books as well. Um, I will be signing all the way over there. Um, and again, if you don't want to stay and wait on the line, or if there are no books left and you want a book, or if you want a double hit of me, I promise I won't read the same thing twice. Um, I will be with Jackie Woodson at Politics and Prose tonight at 6.30 if we get through the traffic in time. So thank you all so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.